You are joining Making a Difference with Melissa Clark, a new show that shares the compelling stories and voices of well-known and everyday people who change the world in big and small ways. Enjoy our guests. Call in or just listen to be inspired for this show was made with you in mind. Please join us every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our special guests. And you can listen to our recast at www.melissaclarkshow.com. Hi, Kate. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm very good. Thanks so much for joining us here on Making a Difference. Thank you for having me. No problem. I'm so interested in your career. Um, you were actually a elementary school teacher before you became an actor. And actually, you started off in acting in a later part of your life. Tell us about that. Yes, I. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a weird story. Um, and I, when I look back over the story, I often think it's not my life. Like it feels like it's something I've just read about. And then I realized that, no, it, it actually was me. I, I went through this. Um, I was a, a school teacher for 12 years, elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had always been sort of a, an, I had been a competitive athlete my whole life. I had coached kids, worked at summer camps and things like that. And so um, teaching was sort of a logical step for me after I decided I didn't want to go to med school. Um, but uh, so I was, I was teaching my students and loving my career. And around the age of 30, um, I kind of, I kind of hit this, this pre midlife crisis. I don't know how, how else to explain it, except that I was just, um, I would lie awake at night, just feeling so empty. Really? And it was really hard to explain because I had everything that I should have and thought I should have to make a happy life. Like I had a car and a relationship and a, you know, a great job and with benefits, <laughs> with benefits and security, which, oh my gosh, that would be really nice right about now. Yeah. Um, and I, I just really, I would lay awake at night and I would just feel guilty for not loving my life, but it was something really deep inside of me that was feeling unexpressed or unfulfilled. I wasn't quite sure. Um, and so through a series of, you know, journaling and meditating and what have you, I came to this sort of revelation. Um, you know, I asked myself, Kate, when you're 80 and you're looking back over your life, what will you regret not doing? And the first thing that came to mind was acting. Yeah. And it was so interesting because I'd never, I had never acted through my life as a as a teen into my adult life. Um, but I was a very, very, very expressive kid. So as a, as a little girl, I was just, I was that, that kid that everyone was sort of saying like, oh, that's just Kate being Kate. You know, I'd be like, yeah. everyone attention, we're gonna put on a show, you know, I have a show to perform. You know, I was sort of that person, right? Like I was right. full of life and so full of expression. And, um, but it kind of got, it kind of got, shut down at a, at a young age. Um, I went to a lot of different schools. My family moved around a lot. I was always sort of not fitting in to the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I had, you know, this sort of really vibrant, expressive personality that was, you know, I was so used to having come out of me slowly sort of got filtered as I was trying to navigate these new social circles and find out who I fit in with. And and then I ended up finding sports and then competed my whole life. So arts for me were like back burner. Right. So when I went through this sort of midlife crisis, it was like, it was almost like the little girl in me was saying, Hey, remember me? You forgot me back there, you know? And, and wow. uh, so I took my first acting class at 30 and uh, I just was, that was good for me. I was a passionate teacher by day and a actress with a dream and, just hobby actor at night. And I would do, you know, community theater or, you know, the occasional, you know, industrial video <laughs> um, or whatever, you know, something just to 
you know, keep my acting chops going and to feel really connected to acting because I, I fell in love with it immediately as soon as I took my first class. Um, so five years later, I was still acting sort of on the side and teaching during the, the day. Mm -hmm. And the, the moment that made me decide to leave the classroom was it, like, you can't make it up. It's, it, you, you know, when they say you can't make that up, <laughs> but it truly happened. It was, um, I was teaching a group of three, four, grade three, four students. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, we were learning about Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And these kids were from really diverse backgrounds. Um, some had come over from uh, refugee camps. Um, a lot of kids were, you know, some of my kids were in social housing. Um, and it was a really struggling school, but with great spirit and a real passion for community. And I was teaching them about Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And we were making our own dream speeches. Mm -hmm. And I was like, boys and girls, just because this is all you know, does not mean this is all there is for you. You know, right. let's get wild and crazy. You know, it was one of those days of, you know, excitement and you could see all of these little lights going on. And one of my kids came up to me and she said, Miss Drummond, what's your dream? And I said, interesting. Well, besides teaching you, um, my dream, I guess was, it has been to be always been to be an actress. And she just looked me right in the face, like with no judgment or anything. And she just said, well, then why aren't you doing it? Oh my goodness. And it hit me like, yeah like a two by four in the face. And I thought, I, okay, I have been, you know, I've been, was in love with acting. I was just like, you know, it was, I was alive more than I had ever been. Um, and this is in your core as you're doing this stuff at night, you're doing your, your classes at night. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was studying acting at night and, mm -hmm. um, teaching during the day. And basically that was my life. Um, and so I, I was really thinking about what this little girl asked me and I, I decided that I, it was time for me to live by my words. And so I wrote a letter to my school board and I said, I need a year off without pay. Uh, I need to pursue this other area. I need to be a living example for my students, but most importantly, I needed to honor myself. And right. so I took the year off and I moved to Toronto. Um, and it was terrible. It was an awful, awful experience. Um, it was terrifying. I, you know, I sold everything I had. I moved to a basement apartment outside of Toronto and had wow. my dog and me, and that was it. And all of a sudden I, I was, I was just me. I, I didn't have a, I wasn't somebody's partner. I wasn't a teacher. I wasn't a coach. I wasn't, I was just me in a basement with my dog trying to be an actress in at 35 years old and you know so was, you were single at the time you were just by yourself yeah wow that's gutsy yeah. <laughs> yeah, it something and I like but I'll tell you I learned I learned a lot about myself um mm -hmm. what my core values truly were and and everything like when you're faced with just yourself which is sort of what we're is happening right now with us yeah with all of us yes uh we spend a lot of time on our own um you know, you really just have to sit with yourself. Um, and so as when March came around uh, of that year, so I had, I had moved to Toronto, you know, I had an agent tell me that I was too old to dream of being a movie star. And then he handed me my resume back and that's not true at all. There's that's the not, door. Yeah, that's uh, not true. What's that woman's name? That older woman's name? I, I don't know her name. Do you know who I'm talking about? She's an older lady. And uh, she's been in a couple of films. She's got to be in her 80s. She started out. I can't remember her name. I'll find her name. And I'll yeah, her I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot of stories of people that are later on that have, you know, um, pursued their dreams. But I was like, boy, you don't know me, do you, mister? Because I'm an athlete. And athletes, we have the go again mentality. It's like, we lose, we go again. We lose, we go again, you know? And so I said, you know, like that's really helped me in my, in my career. But just as I was about to go back to, to teaching after my year was up in Toronto. Right. And um, I booked one of my first biggest roles and it was in a video game and it was going to be about two weeks, two years of work, which I didn't know at the time, but at the 
the initial booking was a lot of work and I asked for an extension to stay in Toronto one more year. And then every time I'd go back, go to go back to the classroom, I would get, you know, I would, I would book something significant enough to make me stay. So wow. it, like, the universe kept saying, nope, you're staying. Nope you're staying. Where do you think you're going? Come back. What? No, 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 no. Right here. Yeah. So, so that was that your, was that your bit, your paid role? The, the video game? Was that your first paid role or? No, I didn't. I mean, my first paid role would, would probably have been, you know, some, you know, smaller independent video out of Ottawa where I was living. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you're a Canadian, right? You're, you're yeah. from Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a Canadian. Um, and I, you know, I, I did a movie with Mina Savari. I think that might have been my first big one or with Alexis Liddell. Like I had small little roles here and there, enough to make me love the industry enough to, mm -hmm. to say, oh, I'm really doing it, you know, keep me here. So, it, you know, my first like real, real paid role where it was, there was sort of stability to it and it was enough to make a difference in my mm -hmm. life was probably um, the video game Splinter Cell Blacklist. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. And so you, so now you're done with teaching, right? After this whole happened with the video game, you're done with teaching, right? You just said, that's it. I'm, I'm done. And now oh. you just, you pursued acting. I'm sure you miss your students and everything, right? Um, I cannot. I cannot talk about teaching or my mm -hmm. students without getting choked up mm -hmm. because I, um, I always say I was cursed with two passions. It's easy to have one passion and just yeah. to ignore everything else. But when you have two, it's always like, you always feel like you're betraying somebody. Right. If, you know? And, um, so my students, um, are my world and, um, I, I, when I decided to leave the classroom, I had to, you know, let my board know that I wasn't coming back. They said basically like come back or quit. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to quit. And I, I cried gallons and gallons and gallons of tears. I just was so, I was so, um, scared and, uh, it, it was like leaving your family for the first time, you know? And, but the coolest thing about it, it uh, that, that's happened is that I've had, I've maintained contact with a lot of the students Good. I taught. So <laughs> one of my very, very, very first students in kindergarten, my first year teaching kindergarten, four years old. Um, then I taught him again in grade four. And then I taught him again in grade six. He sent me an email um, probably a year ago, not even a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, telling me that he was getting married. Oh my goodness. And he talked about the women in his life who have made a difference. And he named, he said his mother and me and his uh, <laughs> fiance. That's so sweet. Like I'm so sensitive. I just fall and ball, but I'm yeah. all, you know, I'm always encouraging my students to, to send me notes and stuff. And so I get, I get updates occasionally from them. And you know, the, the kids that I taught are now adults and are now, you know, having families and stuff like that, which is very strange. Uh, um, but yeah. I think I'll always be a teacher. Um, you could see it in your face. Yeah. <laughs> you could see the proudness in your face. I love it. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad that you're an actress now too, because you entertain us. And I was looking at your, um, your long list of your roles and actually one of them stuck out from it. Well, all of them stuck out, but I like uh, Mrs. Cooper. You played in Trapped. Right. Which is a film about the Alex Cooper story. And uh, Alex Cooper, um, she came out to her uh, parents when she was 15, and they sent her away to what a conversion. Can you tell us about the story? I think it was a conversion house to try to convert her back to being yeah. straight. Yeah. And that yeah, turned that, out very well. Mm -hmm. That's a very powerful story, and it's a true story. Uh, it's mm -hmm. based on the um, on the the autobiography called Saving Alex um, mm -hmm. that she wrote herself that anyone can find online and read. Right. Um, but yeah, essentially, Alex grew up um, in a Mormon family, mm -hmm. um, and when she discovered that she was gay, um, you know, her parents thought she was fooling around with a, another boy and that the boy was potentially not part of their community and they were pressuring her and pressuring her to say, you know, you're not, do you know what you're risking by this promiscuous behavior? Not having any idea that 
their daughter was interested in in girls. Mm. Um, and when Alex announces to her parents that she is in fact uh, interested in girls, um, it destroys her parents mm -hmm. to the point where um, they kick her out of the house immediately. She goes and lives uh, with a friend and then they made arrangements to have her move into a conversion uh, therapy home, um, which is, <laughs> this story is, is, is um, sickening in so many ways and yet um, so heroic, it's such a, a hero's journey for Alex Cooper. Um, she lived with these, uh, the, this couple that ended up being charged um good Be yeah because they they actually tortured her they tortured her yeah wow. they, and they had her have rocks and wearing a backpack and yeah. oh my feel God. the physical because she couldn't feel the spiritual weight of her homosexuality they would mm -hmm. make her wear a backpack and load it full of garden rocks like massive rocks and have her face a wall unbelievable and it and and to read about these things um was i i would you know i would i would cry did um, you meet did you meet her i didn't get a chance to meet her she had a skype call with addison holly our lead who played mm -hmm. alex mm -hmm. in the movie um and it was really interesting because addison passed on a message to me and she said she said the one thing i want the person who's playing my mother right she said could you please give kate a message. Um, she said, please make sure that Kate doesn't make my mother out to be a monster. Okay. Because the, the challenge is, um, as an, as an actor stepping into a role like this is that you re you have to defend your character. You have mm -hmm. to, you, mm -hmm. you can't judge anything that you're doing because you need to honor this true person. And so, um, Alex's mom truly, truly felt that she was doing the right thing because in that faith, homosexuality doesn't only mean that you, you are not given, allowed to go to the promised land after death, you know, mm -hmm. into eternal, the eternal kingdom, but you're mm -hmm. actually doomed to hell for eternity. So the thought of her daughter being in hell for eternity was not worth the risk of right. three months on earth trying to have her be converted to, to being straight. So the, the scene that you had, um, you know, you left Alex at the house along with your husband and that was pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. How did you feel? Like, how did you feel as an actor? I mean, after that, you, you seem pretty sensitive. Did you cry after that? Because this poor girl's like, don't leave me here. Like, how, how can somebody leave their child there? But she thought she was doing the right thing. So how did you feel playing that part? I cried as, as um, Alex's mom would have cried and did. I mean, the story, you know, I, I read the, the, the story. I researched her mom and what she was like and tried to... Um, really tried to bring the essence of her heart to this character. Mm -hmm. um, she, it was, it was a, it was a horrendous time for them, mm -hmm. um, for all of them. But as a mother, leaving your hand, your daughter in the hands of someone that you don't know, um, but, yeah. but feeling like it is the, the right thing to do to save her. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I have goosebumps right now because it was such an impact. It was it, the, the, it was such an impactful role for me. Um, I couldn't read anything about the Mormon faith uh, while I was filming. I couldn't talk about the movie with my partner. Mm -hmm. I, I literally was, I was a devout Mormon for that time of my life shooting because, you know, in terms of the preparation and everything, because I didn't want to be influenced by my own personal feelings. I didn't want mm -hmm. to be by other people's feelings. I just wanted to defend this character so that I could help tell this really powerful story. But there's another, there's another scene that was really difficult where we get to see her and she shows me the bruising on her, on her shoulders. And, um, she says that they're beating her mm -mm. and, you know, every instinct in me as a human being is like, protect, 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 protect. Right, right. And so to fight that as an actor and just keep saying, it's, 
that it that is less than that is less harmful and hurtful and damaging to you than eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. And so I had to have my you know the preparation that I did for that role was immense because I really had to make sure that I I always fell into the heart of Mrs. Cooper as opposed to falling into my own heart. Um, and it was very convincing, very convincing. Thank you, you. Did a, you did a great job with that. Thank you. Good job. Thank now, did, you. Did you get any backlash from anybody? You know how people, you know, they, they think that you are Mrs. Cooper. Yeah. You know, did anybody come after you and say anything? Like, why yeah, would you yeah. do that to your child? Or, you know, even though you're just playing a role. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I had a couple of, um, I had some comments. Yeah. Mm. I actually post something on social media and say, you know, this is what I do for a living is right. I, I take on these roles so that you can be um, entertained for one, but for in this particular case, it will spark a conversation that will hopefully lead to change. And yeah. so I put myself in a position where um, I am that um, hated character, but it's for the necessity of the story. So I, I did have to go on and remind people that I am L very LGBTQ friendly and I'm an ally and that, yeah. um, that is not me or my belief system. Um, and, then, and then some of the fans were like, how would people think this is like you? You're like the opposite of this. And, and, then, it, and then it became a conversation of um, what it takes to, to tell a story like that that is so opposite of who you are as a person you know mm -hmm. as an actor and so then it became a conversation about that so did you uh receive any new fans from the uh gay community yeah, yeah yeah i i um yeah i don't know if it was specifically from that i'm sure it was i mean my i'm so blessed my fandom is just it grows daily and and um you know it's it's really really i have a really supportive community um mm. so yeah That's i nice. whether it was that or you know, Winona Earp or Utopia Falls, who knows? It was, it just keeps growing. And I'm, I'm just happy about that. I love it. Let's talk about Utopia Falls. Uh, where, where, what station is this on? Utopia Falls is airing, uh, streaming on Hulu. Hulu. And in Canada, it's streaming on CBC Gem, okay. um, which is our online streaming site. And then it's also playing in Russia, but I have no idea. Like I... I I love the concept of it, and I love that they used Busta Rhymes to, to, to introduce this whole world to these kids. What year does this take place? Um, well, it takes place in the not-so-distant future, like maybe 300 years in the future. Oh, okay. That's not Yeah. Bad. And you play Attorney Fidra. I play Authority Fidra. Authority Fidra. I'm sorry. Attorney. That's okay. Attorney, you'll, you'll be a, a teacher next. Um, That's okay. That, tell us about the character. Okay, so I'll give you a little premise about what the show's about first. It's mm -hmm. um, basically what it is, is um, it's about this sort of utopian society that exists under a dome and it's divided into sectors. So very much like Hunger Games was divided into sectors. Uh, New Babel, our, our, our society is also divided into sectors where there's industry and nature and reform and progress. Mm -hmm. And basically they all have their specific jobs and everyone feeds the society in their rightful way. And they're fed their belief system and fed their culture and it keeps everyone very happy and mm -hmm. status quo. So this happens uh, because of something called the big flash. Uh, mm -hmm. back in the back, back, back in the day that led, everything went dark on the world and everyone went underground. Mm -hmm. And years and years and years later, when they come above ground, this is what they have. This is the life that they are prescribed. But no one knows anything about any history as you and I know it today. So all history has been erased. Mm -hmm. So um, once a year, there's a competition called the Exemplar, which is very much like America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. It's like the top competitors from each sector come in. Uh, to compete with either song or dance, um, and uh, and the sectors all vote on this the candidate that they want to win, mm -hmm. and there's you know esteem and bragging rights and things for your sector if you win. Right. Just as this group of kids, the hero kids, are about to compete in the exemplar, they're in a party in the woods and they discover this hidden rock face door that goes into something called the archive that is voiced by Snoop Dogg. I love it. <laughs> and it is literally a time capsule of mm -hmm. all pop culture from mm -hmm. 
decades, well, I guess at this case, centuries and centuries earlier. There's right. hip hop, there's EDM, there's gospel, there's fashion, there's books. They don't even have books in this, in New Babel. There's, you know, um, everything you could possibly think of record players and what is that? And what is, there's money and I people are like, it. there's this weird paper and there's diamonds. What is this glass? You wow. know, there's, and it's, and these kids have no concept of what it is, but they start to become influenced by what they hear in terms of the music and mm -hmm. see in terms of the culture and they that starts to influence their performances at the exemplar competition that's wow. where I, I am the head of the police force in new babel mm -hmm. my job is to make sure that every single new babel citizen stays in line follows the laws mm -hmm. doesn't challenge anything and and maintain status quo so when these kids start sort of you know showing something that looks a little bit other Mm -hmm. um, then I start getting very, very upset. So I that's, I'm the antagonist of the show. Um, I am the, <laughs> the enforcer in red. It's fantastic. This character is fantastic. She's terrifying and, and I love her. Um, and, uh, yeah, really, really, really fun show. Really you, fun show. Do you guys shoot in the States or he, or in Canada? We shoot in Toronto. In Toronto, okay. But you guys are not doing anything at the moment right now. Everything is shut down. Everything's shut down. Okay. Yeah. When does the next, is there a next season that's coming out? We hope so. Uh, I mean, if, if you know, if, if this hadn't happened, if, you know, the pandemic wasn't, wasn't, you know, our primary thing, shutting the world down right now, um, mm -hmm. my hope is that we would have been on camera for season two right now. But yeah. um, who knows? Who knows what... Uh, What's so now on? you're just, you're buckling down. You don't have any new projects lined up for right now. I did actually. I had projects lined up that I can't say. Um, I was due to go to, uh, to start shooting and um, yeah, everything is. Okay. <laughs> definitely. So yeah. How are you handling this coronavirus? How is it over there? Because here we're pretty bad. We're in, you know, in the United States, I'm in New York. Uh, so how is it over there? Are you guys going out with men? We have to go out with masks on every day. I can't find it. <laughs> yeah, um, it's really strange. Um, I, I, it's, I still have to pinch myself. I still feel like mm. it's not real. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I have friends in New York and uh, a friend of mine's sister is a, is a nurse in one of the hospitals in New York where the transport truck is parked up front. And um, yeah. so I, I am hearing the news and reading the stories and it's just, it's horrifying. Um, here in Canada, I recently moved outside of the city center of Toronto mm -hmm. by fluke in November. Mm -hmm. um, and I purchased a home outside in a smaller city outside of Toronto. So um, my, I have a lot of space around me. I have, you know, I have a yard and trails and it's a big wide spaced community. Right. So I don't, I don't see what you're seeing outside your window right now. And right. I, think, and I think that's a good thing for me. Um, I, you know, my mother is here on her own in an apartment building. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm sick to death worrying about her all the time um we're you know we were we're encouraged to not even go and see our family members okay. even if we are to walk you know six feet or ten feet apart and do okay. a, a walk together which is what i was doing mm -hmm. um but i will go out and get her groceries and get our groceries here and we send one designated person um and i go out and come back in um you know, the numbers are rising, uh, everywhere I go, there's, everyone's wearing masks and gloves. Um, but I think, I, I'm sorry, that's okay. I was just going to say, I've been out once, uh, twice in the last, uh, three and a half weeks of my home in terms of going to a place. I've been walking the dog like crazy, right? Um, but in terms of going to any specific place, I've been out three times. My partner, on the other hand, is an essential service provider. Um, he does deliveries and courier. Um, oh, wow. So he is out there on the front lines every day. And um, I, I keep saying to people, please don't boredom shop online because right. it's people like my partner yeah. who have to put themselves at risk to get you that macrame kit. 
That's or right. they, you know, it's That's just right. like only get the essentials because I, I don't think people realize that the essential workers that are out there are constantly putting themselves at risk to make sure that everyone who is staying home and safe um, gets what they want. And meanwhile, he has to go out and subject himself to that. So Aww. yeah, it's just, it's very, um, it's, mm. very, it's a very scary time, I think for everyone. Yeah, please thank him for us. We're always thanking our people here in, in this shop. I always say thank you. Everything is covered up now. You can't even, you know, I was in CVS yesterday and a girl got next to me and I'm all covered. I look like a crazy person. The more crazy are you look here, the less people come closer to you. Um, but she got so close to me and I, and I said, it, she goes, I'm sorry. I said, it's okay. I said, I wish I could hug you. You know, this, this is, this is a, a very, a very scary time and hopefully everything will just go down. We didn't yeah. hit our peak yet. So this week we're finding out a lot of, about people who are sick uh, from last week and people who are passing away. So yeah. we're trying our hardest here and, and we wish you luck over there, you know, with the Corona and your, your partner, we, please thank him for us. Thank you. Yeah, I will. I will definitely pass that message on. And, and it's interesting. I've been talking to a lot of, I've been trying to stay very active on social media with the fans um, because um, I, it's not just for them. It's for me as well. I yes. am, I am a natural um, attractor to people. I, I, if I had met you in person, it would just be the longest, biggest bear hug um, nice. because it's just my nature. I, I talk to people in the elevator and end up making friends wherever I go. I just love people um, and to be repelled in yeah. a sort of repel all the time has been very, very difficult. I've, I've, um, I, when I, the first time I had gone shopping, I got back to my car and I just wept. I was so yeah. anxious and out of sorts and sad and scared. And, you know, yeah. because it's so against my natural, um, being. And so I'm finding a lot of solace and a lot of, um, comfort in my online community. So a moment like this of having this time with you is so, yeah. So I'm so grateful for it because it, it's yeah. just a, it's a connection that, you know, a human connection. It's true. That, <laughs> that we need to rely on to get through this for sure. It's true. I know. I see your Instagram. I started following you now and you're very kind with, with your posts. So everybody appreciates that. We, we just appreciate kindness. Yeah. That's all I'm after. Everybody on the political and they want to, you know, point fingers. I don't want to have anything to do with it. You have yeah. something to love and show me about yeah. love. Let's talk. Yeah. Other than that. Yeah. <laughs> go away. Leave me alone. Right. I know we, we can't handle that right now. And there's so much of that going on. So every time I see somebody that says Trump this or Cuomo this delete, delete. And that's what I'm doing from now on. I don't care if I've known you for 20 years. Yeah. You have so you want love. Let's do love baby. You know, yeah. if, you have to protect yourself. You have to surround yeah. yourself with the good energy because as, as well, it's very easy to get sucked into the negativity of everything that's going on. And that does not serve the planet in any way, shape or form. Like no. we as physical beings are, are on the ground. What energy we have, we put into the earth. Like it truly is a scientific thing. And so, you know, daily trying to find those moments of gratitude for what is going on. And I'll tell you, like I have heard birds and animals and I've seen things in nature that have ha obviously have been in hiding for it, the for world many. is healing itself right now. It is mama nature is saying, thank you. I'm so sorry to put you through this, but yeah. you know, someone said to me, it's interesting that we as a, as a, a humanity has been suffocating mother earth. And then the coronavirus is, is a respiratory illness. Um, that attacks the lungs of us yeah. when we've been attacking the lungs of Mama Earth. So hopefully when this passes, we, um, we all come out of it with a little bit more reverence for, uh, for our resources and for everyone on, on the planet. So that's the hope anyway. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness with that. We need, we need to hear this. Thank you. And <laughs> Thank you. one last question for you. Yes. What advice would you give to somebody who wants to change their career at the age of 30? Do it. Do it. <laughs> I, I would say, um, it's not easy. It's not easy. I will never paint the picture that it's, Oh, look at you. You just get to snap your fingers and have a new career. It is not easy. But if there is something inside of you that feels ignored, 
and there's something in you that feels like it's, you know, needing a fire inside of you that needs a little stoking yeah. and it's worth investigating. And, and what you don't want to do is you don't want to bring your dreams with you to your grave. You know, you want to, you want to, you want to go at it at this life. You know, this is, this is not a dress rehearsal, right? We get one, one shot at this particular, uh, particular life. Um, so I would say, do it, surround yourself with people, um, that will encourage you and, and help you when you feel like you want to run back to mm -hmm. your comfort. Um, but just a tiny little baby step each day. And next thing you know, you'll look behind you and you'll be like, what? Look how far I came. I love so, it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, people can find you on your Instagram. Is that correct? Yep. They can find me on Instagram at uh, Kate underscore Drummond. And then I'm also very active on Twitter uh, at Kate Drummond underscore. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, they'll find me. I'm, I love it. You're I'm all over right. out there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We look Thank forward to you. seeing your beautiful acting and, uh, Utopia, uh, Falls, um, is on Hulu right now. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you so Kate. much. Thank you. Thanks.